Thank you, everybody. Uh, as, as Carl said, it may seem a little bit counterintuitive to talk about securing uh, long-term oil demand in an environment where most of the industry's conversations with itself are generally about uh, securing supply. Uh, but there are some issues uh, which I think are relevant uh, and particularly relevant to the NOC community. Uh, and just to sort of repeat the introduction, I, my name is Andy Brigham, I'm from Ernst & Young. This is the fifth year that Ernst & Young has sponsored and spoken at this event. Uh, we are very happy to do so both as a uh, indicator of our commitment to the oil and gas industry in general and the national oil companies in particular. Uh, in turning to oil demand, uh, I want to talk about a couple of things. One is the trajectory, and the second thing, which is probably a bigger issue, is volatility, uh, and volatility of uh, demand, but also volatility of price. Uh, and as we go through that, I'll try and refer back to some of the issues that were raised in the first session this morning, uh, because they do, they do repeat about partnerships. Uh, and also about how the industry relates to the public. Uh, and I think there are some important lessons that can be learned from the way the industry has developed over the last 20 years, which link to its public perception and possibly underlie some of the issues that the industry has had in the whole public policy arena. Well, this, is, this is always the most nerve-wracking part of any of these things when you see if the technology works. So, there we go, that's good. Uh, various speakers uh, this morning talked about uh, oil as a, uh, well, both, both primary energy demand and oil as a share of energy demand. And, th and there are lots of forecasts around. This is the IEAs. Uh, so it's heavily demand-driven, uh, uh, as in they don't take too much account of the supply side of the equation. Uh, what you can see is what everybody's been saying, the, the demand for primary energy is going to grow substantially. Uh, but what you also see is that demand for oil, although it's going to go up uh, over the next sort of 10 years or so, it does begin to flatten out. So in 20 years' time, uh, it's running at, uh, I think it's somewhere projected around 100 million barrels a day. Uh, and as a result of that, it's going to be a reducing... Uh, component of the overall energy mix. However, if you've been around the industry as long as I have, you've seen plenty of forecasts over the years and you seldom look back 10 years later and recognise the forecast as being particularly representative of reality. Uh, and I think with this forecast too, uh, there are a lot of risks that both impact the overall level of demand but also impact the mix. Uh, and I just want to talk about some of what those risks are, what their impact may be, and how the industry uh, can seek to, if not manage them, then at least address them. Uh, firstly, if you look at where the demand's coming from, again, this was said earlier on this morning, but what you've got is, is, is effectively a world of two halves. You've got the, uh, the old OECD countries where demand is flat to declining, where any new fundamental demand for oil in particular is outweighed by presumed efficiency gains. Uh, and then you've got the, either the, I'll call them the newly developed or developing uh, countries, which are still experiencing a period of relatively high energy intensive growth uh, and are as a result expected to suck in uh, progressively more oil over the next particularly 10 years. Uh, and if you're an oil producer, then you may look at this and think, actually, that's not so bad. Uh, we'll ca carry on with our priorities, which is really solely about how do we develop the reserves we've got, how do we manage the risks, how do we manage the safety issues, how do we manage the costs uh, around uh, developing those reserves. Uh, but I think there are, there are some risks uh, to the oil, pro the oil demand projections. Uh, and... Uh, I'll just talk briefly now about what they are. Uh, the first one, and it's a point that was made uh, several times in the last hour, is that the age of easy oil is over. Uh, and unfortunately, with that, the, that means the age of cheap oil is over. Uh, and what we 
have seen recently and what we expect to see going forward is that the price of oil is, is going to stay high and probably trend up. Uh, and we don't know, uh, because we have not been in this situation before, apart from a few months in 2008, how the world is going to react to a permanent reset of the oil price uh, to a higher level. Uh, what we did see uh, in 2008 was definite uh, uh, proof of demand destruction uh, for those few months. It was around $150. And I don't know if any of you were listening to the uh, radio this morning, uh, probably not, but the, one of the things on the radio this morning was yet, yet another of these wonderful surveys uh, which said that a third of people have changed their driving habits or avoided journeys uh, in the last six months because the oil price or the petrol price has gone up and two-thirds would consider changing their behaviour going forward. So we can see that there is going to be a price impact and indeed there's been some uh, modelling done of which uh, this, is, this is, uh, is an example which simply illustrates the impact on gross domestic product various parts of the world for a... Uh, an increase in the oil price from 100 to 250 dollars over 2011, 2012, and you can see it is substantial. It's particularly substantial in those countries which are energy intensive, which tend to be the ones that are higher growth, uh, and that of course feeds through, uh, feeds back to oil demand. And we've had some economic metric, uh, economic metric modelling done, if I can say the word, uh, which indicates that. In the short term, you're looking at about a 0.2% drop in volume demand for a 10% increase in price. In the longer term, you're looking at a 0.7% uh, decrease. And you may, if you say 50, 100 to $150 is quite an extreme increase to model on, uh, just to remind everybody in the room that that's a 50% increase. In the last 11 months, we've had a 60% increase. So... Uh, the chances of there being a shock uh, are quite high. And that's e eco econometric modelling, uh, which is statistical in nature and so doesn't take into account one-off shifts, uh, either in behaviour or usage, uh, that could drive a permanent change in the level of demand. Uh, so what you may see is things you expect around the edge, which is substitution of oil by gas, uh, I think anybody who's had exposure to the petrochemicals industry uh, in the room will have had first-hand experience over the last couple of years of the impact of the change in relative pricing, uh, on, particularly on olefins, uh, as cheap U.S. gas has changed that particular market. So it can happen. We've had take-up of some new technologies. I'll talk about that later because it's been marginal so far. Uh, and we still have uh, the whole public policy issue uh, and what the reaction of the governments in consuming countries is going to be. So price in and of itself is an issue. Uh, you combine that with the other element, which is price volatility. Uh, and this graph shows uh, fairly effectively that the last couple of years have seen a level of volatility in the oil price, which is unusual. I mean, we, we've had a few permanent shifts around sort of 73, 80, uh, but we've not had a period of sustained volatility at this level for quite a while. Uh, there are various schools of thought about what causes it. Uh, you know, one group of people saying it's fundamental driven, uh, and you have another group of people who are saying that there's a big impact from the paper trading market on it. Uh, I think the, the, the best answer is it's a mix of both. Uh, there certainly are fundamental issues that, that are going to drive volatility going forwards. Uh, if you look at how the supply chain has changed in the last 20 years, uh, we've gone from a sort of a regional point-to-point -point supply chain uh, to a fully global supply chain where demand and supply are now geographically dispersed. Uh, we've also gone from uh, production in fewer to production in a much higher number of locations and of those locations we now have 
a relatively high proportion that are at some risk of production interruption. So we've, uh, we've seen estimates that uh, of the 80 or so million barrels a day of production, at the moment some 8 million uh, is either coming from countries that are experiencing unrest or where there is a, a chance that they will experience unrest of whatever type. Uh, what that does is it means that even though we balance supply and demand, uh, it makes that balance very vulnerable to uncontrollable events. Uh, and that leads on to a much higher level of activity in the next area, which is the whole trading uh, infrastructure and the oil trading infrastructure, which has itself exploded over the last five years in terms of volume and sophistication. Uh, and there almost certainly has been some impact of that on the underlying oil price. Whether it's a permanent impact or whether it's just an impact in short-term volatility is difficult to say, but given the very high ratio now of uh, financial volumes to physical volumes, then there's bound to be some washback into the physical oil market. Uh, whichever, where, whichever way the balance goes between those factors, uh, it's very unlikely that either of them are going to go away. So the oil supply chain is going to remain complex and is going to get more complex. On the tra paper trading side, there are limited alternatives now uh, as investments, so they're very attractive. We've seen a lot of new products. It's likely unless and until we get effective regulation of commodity derivative products, which don't hold your breath, uh, we're likely to see more of that. So volatility is likely to be with us for the foreseeable. And you put these, uh, put these things together, what, where does that leave the consumers? Uh, the pr they're looking at a position where oil price is relatively high and is likely to go higher. Uh, Short-term volatility is high, long-term pricing is uncertain. Uh, they have a residual uh, concern over security of supply uh, due to the complexity of the supply chain. And in the background, they have ongoing policy momentum in their own countries towards switching to lower carbon. Uh, and you put that against the background of the fact that we still have a highly imbalanced global economy that is uh, still vulnerable to some unpleasant surprises, uh, as we've seen this week. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of issues. The question, does it matter? Uh, or to put it another way, is there any alternative? Uh, and up to now, the answer has been not really. Uh, there's been some uh, residual incremental switching away from oil, but there's not really been uh, a I'd say a fundamental stroke paradigm shift uh, because oil is, uh, from a technological perspective, very difficult to compete with at what it does. Uh, and it is indeed true that uh, internal combustion engines run best on petroleum products and you can't have wind-powered jets, uh, so there's always going to be a technological support for demand. Uh, but even in the demand projections that are being put together, we're, we're already beginning to see assumptions of uh, increased efficiency. Uh, and cars do not need to be so big. Uh, the short-term impact of a spike in oil price is likely to be a change in the carpool. Uh, planes can be more efficient. They can, travel more, they can carry more passengers per unit of, of uh, fuel burnt. Hydrocarbons that are being used as fuel don't need to come from oil, they come from gas. Uh, come from biofuels. Uh, you can use other forms of power to augment internal combustion engines. Uh, you can use alternative forms of transport, uh, and you can avoid journeys. Uh, and I think it's interesting, given how much of projected oil demand uh, is going to come from the emerging markets, what is driving that demand? A lot of it is being driven by the urbanization of hundreds of millions of people in those emerging markets. So far, that's been on a uh, pattern that's, that basically absorbs a lot of oil uh, because, it, because there's a big component of auto transport. Uh, will that pattern stay the same if oil's at a fundamentally different price? Uh, it may do, but it may not, and at least there's a risk there. Uh, 
this chart is quite interesting uh, because it uh, basically sets out theoretically how willing consumers would be to look at an alternative fuel vehicle. Uh, and the thing that surprised me was they're more willing to look at them in the brick economies than they are uh, in the, uh, the more traditional ones. And uh, whether that will actually convert to action, I think, is heavily dependent on price. Uh, but it's there, and it's there in the background. And the world at a $150 price is going to be a different place to the world at a $70 price. Uh, just uh, sort of looping back to one of the alternatives, we already are seeing high take-up of biofuels, uh, and I know that was talked about this morning as being a uh, sort of a, a, a genuinely viable alternative already. They have their own issues. Uh, I think there's been a lot of publicity about what those issues are, uh, but uh, they are there. They, they are expected to grow. Uh, and also we have gas to liquids uh, looming. Obviously, again, there, there are issues around... Uh, the relative economics of gas to liquids versus LNG, uh, and I think that will probably switch backwards and forwards as we see the, the two markets moving, uh, and maybe quite complicated as the, the gas market still moves regionally uh, rather than uh, globally. Uh, so what have NOC has been doing? Uh, they have made some limited uh, moves into, uh, into downstream or gaining exposure uh, to trading volumes, uh, although also pursued some uh, increased vertical integration. Uh, and in that, their activities have been reasonably complementary to the international oil companies, which have by and large been pulling back from their downstream organizations, primarily uh, because if you are an international oil company and one of your key metrics is return on capital employed, it's a lot easier to get a high return on capital employed in upstream than it is in downstream. So we've seen some change uh, in the landscape. Uh, we expect there'll be some more, but the extent to which the NOCs push into this space uh, really depends on how far they want to sort of influence the, uh, the supply chain once you get off, uh, basically offshore, once you get away from the pure upstream. Uh, in terms of what they, what directions they've been going. Just go through these. Uh, basically, for the last 10 years, NOCs have been moving into the acquisition of refining, uh, and with that, moving into the acquisition of some petrochemicals assets. Uh, and that makes sense if you think about it. Those are fairly close to the legacy upstream business. Uh, they have occasionally moved into retail and storage, uh, but not to any great degree. Uh, and we've had some, uh, into, I'll call them semi-integrated semi acquisitions, particularly in 2007 when we had three. Uh, what issues have they faced? What issues are they likely to face? Uh, I think, firstly, the downstream business is actually uh, quite a difficult one to get into in a kind of coherent manner. Uh, and if you look at transactions in the downstream uh, space in the last 10 years, they've tended to be quite fragmented and they've tended to be driven largely by what the incumbents wanted to sell. Uh, so there haven't been many blockbusters, there haven't been many strategic partnerships or alliances. It's tended to be much more opportunistic. Uh, so building a coherent position as opposed to just... Uh, taking short-term financially driven decisions is a challenge for NOCs moving into that market. Uh, and that market itself is getting more complex as the traditional participants pull out. So to take Western Europe as an example, whereas 15 years ago it was dominated by the old IOCs, now it's a patchwork of IOCs, NOCs, commodity traders, retailers, specialist operators, uh, financially backed specialist refiners, uh, all competing in a sort of disaggregated way. Uh, and to loop back to uh, the point around how the industry relates to governments and how the industry relates to consumers, one of the themes of the last 10, 15 years, driven by the transition of the IOCs to a more upstream focused business model, 
uh, has been that the industry, from a public perception, has turned in on itself uh, and has not related to the end consumer uh, to the same degree that it did, say, in the 70s or 80s. Uh, and that, I think, has had an impact on how uh, the oil industry is perceived and that it's now perceived as quite a distant thing. People don't see much of a relationship with the people who actually su supply the petrol. Uh, that creates a background set of public opinion which in turn creates a risk of certain behaviours by public policy setters. Uh, and I think a question for the industry as a whole and for the NOCs as the major producers going forwards is how far do you want to disconnect yourselves from your end consumers? Or how far do you want to retain a connection? Where do you balance that priority versus the relative returns on downstream versus upstream? Uh, certainly in the last 15 years, they've been lower. Uh, but if you have a strategic imperative as well as a short-term profit imperative, then I think it is a question worth asking. Uh, if you look at... Uh, how the downstream market is changing itself, uh, just to go back a few, few issues about it. Uh, if you're going to get into this market, uh, there are things that you need to be aware of. One, it is logistically complex. Uh, two, it is a, it is a, a BTC, business to consumer business, so it's obviously uh, rather different in shape than a, a business to business uh, a model. Uh, also, it, it itself will change. Uh, going forwards as energy usage shifts. So there are a lot of issues to uh, address. Uh, on the physical downstream market, uh, there are also a lot of issues to address if you want to get into the non-physical downstream market or the trading market. Uh, but I think there again, if we look at the position as it stands now, most national oil companies uh, are vulnerable to volatility, price volatility, rather than benefiting from it. Uh, there are now, on the other side of the table, uh, quite a large population of energy traders who benefit from volatility. Uh, and if we are moving now into a world where volatility is going to be the norm, uh, this is another question uh, I think that the national oil companies should be asking themselves is, is it safe to rely on the old long-term supply model, uh, or should we now be building our own trading capability uh, to not just manage our exposure to price volatility, but actually try and benefit from it in the same way that the intermediaries that you're probably already dealing with uh, are doing. And if you look, some of the NOCs are moving into this space, so we know from our own uh, clients that quite a few of the NOCs are now uh, building uh, trading businesses so that they can take more control over the end price of their product. So where does this leave us? The base case central demand projection is quite benign, but it's subject to quite a high number of risks uh, or variations, both upside and downside actually, uh, and they're likely to get uh, more pronounced going forwards. There are unknowns about the impact that a permanently higher oil price, driven by the fact that it's getting much more difficult to find and get out of the ground, are going to have on usage patterns going forwards. But I would say it's complacent to assume that behaviour will stay the same all the way up the price curve. Uh, volatility, uh, I think, is with us. Uh, and it's going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Uh, and NOCs, through the traditional long-term contracting route, have tended to have uh, limited market visibility and visibility of the causes of that volatility. Uh, so in this context, from a strategic perspective, one of the routes to managing demand or influencing demand may be to build more fully global downstream infrastructures to attach to the upstream production capacity. Uh, there will be opportunities to do this as the current market participants pull out, uh, but it will be uh, challenging to do that in a coherent 
and risk managed way and to link finally back to the other theme of this uh, entire congress the one of partnerships one of the best ways to manage a transition into a new uh, business area new operational areas is via partnership and here there are opportunities for not just short-term transactions but long-term strategic partnerships with the IOCs who are looking uh, at their downstream uh, businesses uh, and looking at what to do with them uh, but are also looking at further opportunities to partner with the national oil companies uh, on an upstream basis so I think uh, it's all right as I'm, I'm, I think I'm coming to a close you'll be happy to hear so, uh, so I think it's an interesting area uh, it's an area where I think the industry would benefit from uh, being proactive uh, and I think we'll see some interesting changes in the next five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Um, before you go, just I'm going to keep you here for one. Is there anybody who's got a quick question for Andy before he, he leaves us? Um, we had a discussion about, I think, about whether white van man's finding the price a bit too high, among us other things. Has anybody got any thoughts? One person there. A uh, quick one, Andy. My name is Mohammed al rumhi from Oman. One of the things that you have, uh, you have not mentioned is, uh, or two things I did not hear from you, is the exchange rate issue and the deterioration of U.S. dollars. I think the, the tendency to, is, is to blame. I'm a producer, so I'll, I'll defend producers. I think the tendency is to, to blame producers for the yields in the market, the risks of uh, deterioration of global economic recovery, all because of the oil price. But there are other factors which are self-imposed, like tax, and the other one is the loosening of US dollar particularly, which is the currency traded for crude oil. Can you comment on these two issues, please? Uh, I certainly can. I think uh, it is obviously an issue uh, for non-US demand. Uh, though, if you look at it, the place it's hit most has probably been uh, Western Europe, uh, if, because China, you know, China has a, a soft peg uh, to the dollar anyway. So. Uh, if, if you look at sort of dollar pricing, it's, it's, it's been bad. If you look at non-dollar pricing, then it's been a lot worse. I mean, I can take this country as an example. Uh, during the last spike, the 2008 spike, this country was effectively shielded by the fact that the sterling dollar exchange rate was moving uh, in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, this time it's been uh, moving in the same direction, so it's exaggerated it. Uh, it's interesting to look at the varying dynamics of the gas market versus the oil market, given that the gas market often isn't priced in dollars. Uh, but I think if you come back to fundamentals, uh, what you have at the moment, uh, and likely to have for quite a while, is a situation where you can consider crude as a currency. Uh, and as a currency, uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's better managed than the US dollar, but, but certainly there's a lot more visibility about the money supply, shall we say, uh, than the US dollar. So we've got that issue. Whether that will move us eventually away from dollar pricing for oil is interesting. There have been, uh, there have been in the past some talk about do we move to euro pricing, but I think with the, the euro itself being quite fragile at the moment, uh, that would be a brave call to make. Uh, so I think I agree that the fact that the dollar has been depreciating has uh, effectively made the situation or the impact of rising prices worse in those countries that don't trade in dollars or dollar-related currencies. But I think for the foreseeable, uh, we're likely to have pricing in dollars and we're likely to have a relatively weak dollar. Uh, so I think that's with us for a, for a time to come.